This is From Hero to Zero, a show about the misconception of the demise of the music industry. We talk to heroes to make sense of the alleged zero, the music business. Hi Dave, how Hello. are you? Very nice to see you. Very nice to see you too. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, sitting down with us and talking about Dave Holland, Dare To and so on. You're very welcome. So Dave, uh, you've been in the music business for over 50 years. Um, you've played with uh, different legends like Miles Davis, uh, Herbie Hancock. Um, you've won different awards. How do you see or where do you see the difference between being a musician today, 2016, compared to the different eras of the music um, of the music business that you've uh, um, uh, that you've seen. Yeah. Well, uh, I think the, one of the biggest differences. I think musicians need to take more responsibility now for uh, all aspects of the business. Really. Um, you know, I think in the earlier days it was enough just to play the music, and of course that's still the primary um, focus of a musician's life. Is to you have to have the music first. It's no good thinking about the business unless you've got something to, to put out there, you know. So you have to make sure that the, what you're doing is something you believe in, so it has that conviction to it. I think that's, that the pro we can call it the product side, although I don't want to just categorize music as a product, of course. It's uh, something much more than that. But in, as, in terms of business, that's what it is. And of course, if you've got a conviction, it gives it more power. And if it's, if it's genuine and there's a genuine uh, uh, feeling for what you're doing, it, it gives a lot of strength. Um, but the other side of it is that you have to get more, much more engaged in the business. And uh, on many levels, you know, one of, one of them is, of course, interacting and networking with promoters and agents and so on, and having a, having a um, a relationship with them, you know, and it's not enough just to turn up to the gig and play the music. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people work very hard to present this music and many promoters aren't in it really for the money, you know, they're doing it because they love the music. And I think that needs to be acknowledged by the musicians. They need to feel that they're in some kind of partnership with them. Then you have the whole uh, advent of the internet, of course, which has been a huge step for musicians. Uh, one of the frustrations I had in the early days was that we would make a record and you were dependent in those days on music stores deciding to stock the record and put it in the store. And if they didn't really know your work that well, uh, people would hear the music in a concert and go to the store and there'd be no record. Now, of course, it's easy with a few clicks. You can find the musician, find the records, and do that. So that's a big step forward. Um, the promotion aspect of the internet is big. Websites are important. Social media is important. I see social media as an extension of what we do after the gig. After the gig, I usually go out and talk to people, have a little time to interact with people. And I see social media as just an extension of that uh, humanizing of what we do because people see you on stage and they feel um, somewhat separate from the individual they get close to the music but they don't understand maybe what goes into the life and on social media you can give them a glimpse of what it's like to be on the road what our days are like uh, what we have to do we don't just get up on stage for two hours and play we have to get there we have to deal with airports and overweight baggage and all the things that are to do with that. Um, you know, sometimes not enough sleep, uh, all, all these things. And I think when people see those aspects of your life, they see that the music's a part of a life. It's not just something separate from a life, you know. So there's that aspect. And then the other thing that I'm very interested in right now as an um, independent record producer and an owner of a record company, is the whole opportunity to put out digital releases because I think, you know, one of our biggest audiences on social media right now is 18 to 24 year olds. That the demographics that I see coming off the social media sites. And most of those people are buying their music digitally. Sometimes from, or listening to it on, on sites like Spotify and things like that. 
Um, and so there's a, there's a few things about that. One thing is that I think we're liberated now from the CD format. I don't think we have to only think of putting together a collection of pieces for a CD. We can consider putting out one track and not necessarily putting out a track that's connected to an album. We can record live things. We can have a long 20 minute improvisation, a jam that can be put out there that's not confined by the time restraints of the CD. So all these things I think have opened up a lot of doors um, and possibilities for business. I can talk about other things, but uh, I know you have some questions maybe. It's very interesting. Um, just let's talk about more about your um uh, record company, yeah. Dare2, that's yes. the name of it, and yes. you started it in 2005. Yes. And I saw that um, what caught my attention was the archive series, which are web, you stated on your website, it's the, it says web exclusive series, exactly what yes. you just um, exactly. mentioned. Can you elaborate on that, on the archive series? Well, we, uh, we invested in some mobile recording equipment around the time that the record company started. And since 2005, uh, in fact, before that, uh, we, we started uh, recording live performances. And I have a, a very large collection of uh, things that are on hard drives that are uh, all kinds of projects that I've done, probably starting in around 2003, something like that. And so quintets and uh, big band recordings, um, you know, and good quality, 24 track. So we have the opportunity to take those into a studio to mix. And in fact, the album that we did uh, with an octet uh, called Pass It On was done exactly that way. We didn't re release it as an archive series. We put it out on CD. But the, uh, the recording was done at Birdland, the club in New York. And we recorded seven nights. And out of those seven nights, we selected what we thought were the best examples of certain pieces that we were playing. Um, so we've got this large archive. Um, the other thing is that uh, this year we're planning on doing some recording which isn't just focused on a collection of records. So I might you know, hire a studio for a day and we go in there with uh, maybe this trio and perhaps we'll record three or four pieces. Maybe we'll have a guest on one piece. You know, so we can kind of mix it up. I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, the opportunities that are being afforded now by this new um, situation we're dealing with, you know. So I think it's, um, it, it offers a lot of creative possibilities. Sure, very interesting. Um, and of course we'd have digital booklets still. I mean, those things that people like, we'll still have photos and things like that. That'll go along with the, with the music tracks, you know. Um, often um, musicians have problems with their with the rights to the songs. Yes. So I assume that is not a problem for you? You own all your songs from your yeah, back I have catalog? Yeah, I've never put any music into anybody else's, uh, into anybody's publishing company. I started Lojack Music, which is the name of the publishing company, in 1972, when I did my first uh, uh, recording as a leader. There were a couple of pieces I'd written prior to that, and they had been in a, another company, and I managed to secure them back so now my catalog represents everything that I've done and in, in, uh, that I've written, you know. Um, so as far as my own pieces are concerned, I can do that. Uh, when I record other people's compositions, of course, mechanical licenses are issued and uh, mechanical royalties are paid. So that's something that I take care of as well. And, uh, you know, sometimes if it's a cooperative project, uh, we can negotiate a rate and figure out how to make that work. Mostly. You know, a lot of times record companies negotiate a rate other than what the normal rate is. So. Um, interesting. So you own all, all your songs, which is important because many artists, they actually give them away. Yeah, no, it's, that was a big thing for me. I, I just saw it as part of what my family and I uh, should have as part of our um, cachet, you know, as the music. And the same reason starting the record company. Because, you know, in the normal record company, you don't own the masters. Exactly. The record, the masters are owned by the record company, and I liken and but you pay for the recording, you know. I liken that to like you buy a car, and when you finish paying for the car, you don't own it still. Well, the record companies normally they uh, bill the artist through their royalty payments for the entire cost of the recording and sometimes everything associated with it, plane fares for the producers dinner, you know, hotels, I mean, it, it, you end up not seeing any royalties. I have to say ECM Records is an exception, 
ECM is, was, is very right about the, uh, about the contracts and the business and everything, and they've always been uh, correct about that. But many record companies, if whatever money you get out front is about all you see. And if you don't own your own publishing, then you don't see any money from the publishing side. You get the writer's side. That's 50% goes to the publisher and 50% to the writer. Now, if you have your own publishing company, you get 100% of the mechanical authors, which is money that can finance your business. You know, you need that money to supplement money from gigs and, uh, and help you, uh, you know, for instance, invest in new recordings. You know? Exactly. That would have been my next question, actually. Yeah. Um, many rock and pop artists, they, um, they don't get lots from playing gigs or selling uh, digital or physical CDs, yeah. so they invest uh, in, uh, in merchandising. Yes. Do you do that as well? We've, we've done a little bit of merchandising, you know, some t-shirts, some hats occasionally and things like that. But uh, I don't have an organization where we can have somebody selling that stuff. And normally on a tour, you know, uh, at this tour we're flying almost everywhere. And of course it involves extra cases and, and you know, it's a lot more to organize. I don't even bring CDs on a tour like this. Uh, and as I, as I said, you can find the CDs online anyway. If we're touring on a coach, which we do sometimes, when it's logistically possible, we have a nightliner that we have beds on and we can do overnight trips. That makes it easier. You can then bring some extra things for merchandising. But unfortunately, um, you know, because it is a good source of income if you can do it. We have a few things on the website that you can buy, some t-shirts and things like that. So we've dipped into it, you know, but um, uh, so far I haven't seen the revenue stream to be big enough to make it worth the trouble, yeah. to be honest, right sure. now. Um, last question, maybe. After 10 years of having your own company, would you say that would have been, uh, that was uh, the, a great thing to do? It was the best, one of the, yeah, I think in recent years it was a great business move for me. We've managed to get a distribution network together. Um, there's a couple of companies that I work with in New York, in America. One does the physical distribution and does a very, very good job. And another company does the digital distribution, not only of the CDs, but also of my published music. So you can buy scores and transcriptions of solos and lead sheets of songs and all that stuff can be downloaded from my website at daveholland.com. Um, so, uh, you know, for me it's, um, uh, it, it's given me independence. I can record when I want, how I want. I can decide on release dates when I want them. And um, I can, the other side of it, of course, there's a lot more responsibility. We have to have a publicist, we have to have a, a designer for the, for the album covers and all these things. And of course there's an outlay in it. And I have to say that musicians have to be prepared to spend some money at the beginning in order to get things going. It's no good thinking, you know, I can't spend a thousand dollars on this, you know. You have to be prepared to dip, it's like any other business, it requires investment. And uh, hopefully, you know, you'll get a return on that investment. We, I have to say that so far it's worked very well for me. I'm not, I'm not a millionaire, but um, I, I do what I want to do when I want to do it and the way I want to do it. And I'm recouping the investment I'm making and able to pay musicians and take care of things. So for me, it's uh, good. My, my, most of my income is still from performing. Okay. I have to say, yeah. Uh, that's that's the bread and butter of the music, and I think even big artists, you know, like Madonna and, and Prince, and the, the, by far the most of their income is coming from the performance, which is why the record companies are trying to take a piece of that now. That's, they've got these 360-degree exactly. contracts where they not only want a piece of your record, they want a piece of your merchandise, they want a piece of your income from the gigs, and that. Of course, we're free of that. They, we don't, uh, we're not quite in the big league to, for them to, to, to come like vultures and do that. But um, yeah, it's an interesting business, you know. And, and I have to say just one other piece of advice, stay on top of the business. Keep read, you know, read about what's going on, stay with new developments and so on. Um, uh, you have to take, a, take responsibility, take some responsibility for doing this. You don't, it's no good sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring and waiting for someone to do it for you. You've got to step up and do it. Great, well, thank you very much, Dave. You're All very the best. welcome, thank, thank you. you. And good luck to you with, the, with your project. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay, nice talking to you. Same here. All right, bye.